You are listening to Peak One Sports. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Sports Page on the Peak One Sports Network. I am Ashton Nix, your host. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the Peak One Sports YouTube page. Comment, hit that notification button so you get an alert every time an episode drops, whether that's an episode of the sports page or any other of our amazing shows here on the Peak One Sports Network. And listen to all of the Peak One Sports shows, however you listen to podcasts. Joining us today is a very special guest. Uh, he currently is the uh, bullpen catcher for the Cleburne Railroaders. I'd like to introduce Nick Sanchez. What's going on, Nick? How's it going, man? Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for uh, carving out time in your busy schedule to uh, to be on this show. I know baseball is really weird with uh, schedule with so many games just about every day. I know y'all are just in a series getting off the star, uh, all-star break right now, but uh, I'm glad in between all kind of travel games, everything you were able to jump on with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, before we get started, I just want to go ahead and give a shout out to our sponsors. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Betalytics. The Betalytics dashboards allows you to quickly identify the top graded <clears throat> best bets and hottest trends. Use promo code PEAK1 for 25% off when you sign up today. Go to betalytics.com to start betting smarter. Uh, smarter. Now, uh, for some of our listeners who don't know, I know some of y'all follow me. Uh, on social media and do know that I, I write for a local news source here called the Burleson Buzz, a local news website. And I was approached to do a, a player profile on Nick because he is a, a local resident here. He went to high school just right down the road for Burleson High School and now playing for the Cleburne Railroaders. Nick, what is it like playing professional baseball? for uh, basically a local a local sports team um i it's a it's a blessing for sure you know i remember going to railroader games when i was junior in high school senior in high school and you know the atmosphere there was awesome um, even when it was a brand new team and even now with new ownership and you know new colors i was i was watching railroader games and they were orange and orange and blue and yeah. palmero was there so it's really cool just to do the, the full circle. Um, like you said, being the local kid. And um, I remember taking all Johnson County pictures there when I was in, you know, playing with the Elks, um, taking them right by, right by the train out there in the front of the La Moderna field. So it is, it's so cool just to be uh, part of the community still um, down the road now that I'm 24 years old. Yeah, that's great. I, yeah, I remember when they first uh, came out. Yeah, before they they changed. Now they're the the I guess dark darker blue and red right now. Um, yeah. yeah, they were orange, and I yeah, I remember going to some of the games and seeing Rafael Palmero play, uh, getting pictures with him. That that was really cool. It was a lot smaller than I assumed he would be. Um, we're not going to get into that why he might be smaller, <laughs> bigger, anything like that. But you know, you picture him being a lot bigger of a guy and he may have been uh when he played with the rangers uh but yeah it, it's fun because uh i played baseball in high school i went to joshua here also just right in between burleson and cleburne um never really good and I, I had no shot of college or anything like that but it's cool when the railroaders have joshua night or burleson high school night um and that must be pretty cool being, you know, being in the stadium when that's going on, when you have your alma mater there. Um, Burleson has played some playoff baseball games there as well. Uh, it, it, it's cool because, you, you know, a lot of times it's when you play in professional sports, you're going to a new city you've never, you've never been before. Um, and it's interesting just, you know, 10 miles down the road from your <laughs> – from your yeah. high school stadium or how many ever miles it is close to 10 uh, that you're playing in a professional stadium. Um, I know too, uh, after high school, you played at Cameron university up in Oklahoma. What was, uh, yes. what was that like? Like what was your de decision making in that? Did you have options to go other places? Uh, 
my college, you know, commitment's kind of interesting. So um, I played summer ball all through high school. And I mean, we, I had a, a stacked summer ball team going into my senior year. Um, you know, guys from Grapevine, Southlake, a um, couple guys from uh, uh, Burleson Centennial. And I remember late going to the summer, I was one of the only guys on that team not committed yet. Um, you know, like I said, this team was pretty stacked. Our shortstop, Blaine Jones, starting shortstop for DBU for five years. So um, I was kind of in my own head. Um, I, I was also – one thing that I wish I wasn't was so uh, strict-minded. I told myself that I'm not going to settle for anything below Division Two. And, um, you know, I went on some visits, ETBU. I got some calls from a couple small D1s, Alcorn, a um, couple of the SWAC schools. And, you know, ETBU at the time felt like the right decision for me. But financially, it was tough. And they were making a big, a big change in their program at the time. They had a new athletic director. I thought it was going to be – it was – at the time it was a place. And then um, I made a recruiting video. And I, I remember going into that, into that facility, into that, whatever, making the video and kind of looking around and I was like, I'm going to treat this like I'm the best player here, whether, you know, whether there's division one guys here that are trying to make a video, it, it doesn't matter. Like I'm going to go into this workout and act like I'm a major league baseball player. And so that mindset for the video really helped. And um, with that being said, I sent it to every school in Texas and over 300 schools outside of Texas, um, JUCO, D1, D2. And again, went to some workouts, went to some JUCO visits. And for me, I, at the time, JUCO wasn't an option for me. And I really, I, I kind of wish I would have reflected on that more and realized the bright side of um, junior college baseball and how competitive and how much it can develop you uh yeah but with that being said that video was sent to camera university and uh within a week they called me i got up there for a visit i remember i missed a uh i missed a varsity football practice to go to my cameron visit and um that visit led me to sit that friday night game and uh yeah, it was kind of weird how, I mean, thinking about it now, football was taken really serious. And I'm glad I committed because it ended up, you know, losing me a, a start that day. But, yeah, I committed to Cameron after my visit. Um, the offer was too too good to be true. And, you know, at the time, I, I thought it was accomplished. You know, I, I got the Division two offer, got the visit. And, you know, within a year, I committed going in, like I said, the football season of 16, so my senior year, fall. And I was I was all on board for sure. Yeah, what a what a weird bittersweet moment that was. You're sitting um, sitting for the football game, and you're supposed to you know be in trouble per se, <laughs> being punished, and you're you're probably just excited because you're you're going to play college baseball. Um, yeah, and kind of weird that your coach would still, you know, you think he'd be be a little more understanding there, but yeah, it, it all worked out. That's that's great. And yeah, it's a it's a weird, stressful time, especially when you're have all these opportunities and different options, and you're thinking, "Man, I don't want to make the wrong decision, not only for my baseball career, but just for my life in general." Um, and I know my nephew's kind of going through that. He's starting about to start his junior year, and and college baseball is in the cards, possibly. Um, and and that's just a weird time because it's it doesn't seem you know, after the fact, when you look back, it doesn't seem like it's a, it's obviously a huge decision, but you could have easily picked somewhere else. Um, and that could have completely trained, changed the trajectory of your life. Uh, and you have no clue. Uh, but obviously it's working out now you're, you're playing professional baseball. Um, how did you get involved with the Cleburne Railroaders? Um, so after my 2021, Cameron season so my junior year yeah my junior year um I guess COVID junior year 
it was like our last week of school and I knew, I mean, for the time I was at Cameron, you know, our, our records towards the end of the year weren't so hot. And so I knew we weren't going to make the tournament and I knew when I was going to be home. So, you know, I kind of had, had bullpen catching in the back of my mind and, you know, being involved with baseball. And at that time I didn't want to play college summer ball because I experienced college summer ball and it wasn't what I thought. So I was like, let me, let me put myself around, you know, people that are going to make me better that don't even know they're making me better. And it's funny after this was a season, um, I think 2021, it was either 2020 or 2021. I didn't really catch a lot of Cameron. I, I played a lot of first base and DH and uh, I think 21, I ended up splitting time at catcher. So I still hadn't got, you know, over those 30 starts in college as a catcher yet. And for me, I mean, I committed as a catcher, like catching was my end all be all. And I took a lot of pride in it. And I, at that point it was uh, Mike Jeffcoat. And I called him and he was like, you know, let me get back to you. Let me talk to the owners. And sure enough, a day later, you know, offered me a spot and told me, you know, to come out there. We, you know, we recognize you're still in college. So um, we're going to put you in a B batting practice group as well. And so, I mean, that was, that was kind of the start of it. And I will now, I'll never forget, you know, taking batting practice with some of those guys. And that, that first year was such a big learning curve uh, as far as like professional baseball went. And if you would have told me, you know, a year later that I'd be playing with the railroaders, I would have never believed you. So uh, at that point, I was I think I was 21 or 22, um, the youngest guy in the locker room. Culture shock for sure. Um, but it was it was the best experience and still is the best experience of my baseball career. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that's awesome. It uh, talking about that. That culture shock jumping from college to professional even if it's even if it's minor leagues uh you hear that a lot in all sports i mean from high school to college because everybody who plays college baseball was really good in, in high school they might have been studs they might have been captains yeah uh, and then there's that shock when they're not the best and then you know the same from college uh to professional uh you also um you can correct me if i'm wrong you you had been a middle school teacher and now uh, starting this year you're going to be a high school baseball coach yeah um so last year i graduated college in may of 22 and you know for me i knew that i wanted to teach in the fall but it was it was really pushing it because i was still doing student teaching hours for college and so I knew if I was going to get a job, it was going to have to be something, you know, that really needed a spot or that wasn't really going to be a good fit for me. And so I was kind of getting bummed out. didn't really know I was going to end up, but I ended up student teaching in Cleveland. And sure enough, I got a call like two weeks before school started and was like, hey, we have a spot for you at Wee Middle School. And at the time, it was kind of like, this isn't really what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, I'm... I t another thing I was strict mindset with that I had a bad experience with middle schoolers in college. Um, and so I was like, I'm never doing middle school ever again in my life. And I was a hundred percent wrong about that. I would, you know, I, I loved every part of we middle school in Cleveland, uh, the staff, the principal, the students, the coaches around me, like it was the quickest, like bond forming that I've ever been a part of as far as, and I've been on a part of a lot of teams in my life and uh, you know, a lot of groups and coaches and stuff like that. But this bond with these wheat people were, it was awesome. And so they took me in, um, you know, they took me in as, as the baby on, on campus, which I wasn't used to. I was a fifth year senior coming out of, out of Cameron. So I was like, at that point, I was the oldest guy on the team, one of the oldest guys, you know, and, you know, when we went out or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so now, you know, going into the school, being the 23-year-old teacher that was thrown into this spot. And for those who don't know, or, I mean, not a, people, not a lot of people know this. I, I graduated with a history degree, 
and got thrown into the special education scene at Wheat. And that was another blessing in disguise. Um, I'm still going to be doing special ed, um, working with special ed in, uh, at Centennial or game design school. I'm not really sure I'll be at in the district. And it was the most humbling, best job I could have asked for to start with. Again, the people I was with, the people I worked with were amazing and so, so supportive of everything I did and complimented me when, you know, I, they thought I needed to compliment it or, you know, told me to, hey, I, you know, this kind of needs to be done. This is what you should be doing. And I took everything with a grain of salt. And I, I love that school. I love I love that town. And um, yeah, I'm excited for the for the new journey. Um, being one and done at the middle school is kind of rare, but I, I I told everyone when I was looking for a job, even even the Cleveland people, that if there's a baseball spot anywhere opening up, that I'm not going to let it slip through my hands. Yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> yeah, you never know. You have all those blessings in disguises. And, uh, you know, when you're, you're thinking, man, middle school, I don't think that's going to be for me. And then you get thrown in there and you're like, this, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, especially the, in the special education side. Um, that would be something I'd be terrified of thinking, I, I don't think I'm the right person for that. Um, yes, yeah, especially as a young guy, like, I, you know, my first year going into middle school, which I didn't really want to do at the, at the start, special ed, which I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a roller coaster of a first year. And then on top of that, doing three middle school sports, uh, football, basketball, and track, I definitely knew I had my hands full. But like I said, the support team around me, the staff, the it's you know I I credit the coaches and the the people I work with a lot. Um, my mom has a big pool too. She she's worked in Cleveland for seven years, and she kind of knew that this isn't really one of the where I wanted to start. But you know she she always steered me that Cleveland was a great district, and she wasn't wrong. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm just so grateful for that for that first year and building those connections and friends that I'll, I'll have for the rest of my life. So now you're going to, uh, this upcoming year, you're going to Burleson Centennial. I'm going to the dark side. I am. Yep. Yeah. Growing up, I don't, I don't look at Burleson Centennial as any, any sort of rival. Burleson was more of our rivals when I was in high school. Uh, but yeah. I, I don't know when Burleson, Burleson Centennial, it's a newer school. Um, I'm not sure. I think it was built after I graduated. Uh, so I graduated in 07, so I'm not sure, but yeah, I don't think of them, um, more as a rivalry anyways, but yeah. Yeah. I think they were built in like 2010. I could be wrong, but that's um, different for you. You went to Burleson high school while Burleson Centennial was your rival. Yeah. Uh, it's funny too. Cause I have most of the baseball guys I grew up with playing. Um, they were all Spartans. Um, that 2017 class, especially, uh, we, we're all still really close to this day. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I released the new, I released the news. I was going to Centennial and, uh, I got a lot of mixed reactions, but again, everyone was supportive. Um, a lot of people could have taken it differently. Uh, I, I, I believe that, um, you know, Burleson people, it's 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 split whether whether you want to like you like it or not it is split for sure so um but again a, another staff that i'm excited to work with um i want to shout out coach travis hughes who was my he was a high school coach of mine and in burleson and now he's the head soccer coach at centennial and kind of he kind of threw my name out there to the staff and you know they they liked what they heard and within a week i was i was part of the part of the Spartan staff. So I'm, I'm super excited. I'm super grateful um, to work with coach Senato and coach Geller. And um, again, give back to my community in this way, um, educating and coaching. And that's a, it's a perfect job opportunity for somebody who uh, wants to continue your baseball career because uh, the Cleveland Railroaders play in the American association and they're, their league starts the end of May. Their season starts the end of May um, and goes through the beginning of September, possibly more with playoffs. And I know the railroaders are in the playoff race right now. Uh, so that, that works great for you. So your time off, you can go play for the railroaders. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it overlaps a little bit, but it works out really well. 
Yeah. Uh, it's, it's funny. I tell people that, you know, I, I play professional baseball as a side gig and, you know, it's all jokes. Cause you know, I, I know I have a certain amount of bats and certain amount of games played, but you know, it is for, for the people who don't take this league seriously, as far as the American association, uh, you've been to plenty of games, seen plenty of, you know, you, you kind of know where I'm coming from. Yeah. There is, there is athletes out there that a hundred percent, I believe could play at, the next level, whether it's double A, high A, triple A, uh, you name it, um, MLB even. Um, I've I've been on the team for three years, and I fully believe that there has been at least at least five guys on every team that didn't end up getting the opportunity that I believe should have been at the next level. So, um, you know, contrasting that with teaching and coaching, it's like it both sides bring a lot of Pro, like pros to each job so I can take I can take a lot of things from teaching and coaching to to how I communicate um, with guys on the on the team and stuff like that and vice versa I, I can take this professional kind of side that I've I've learned to adapt to for three years into uh into coaching and teaching yeah I definitely have a respect for uh, minor league sports uh, because obviously I follow minor league sports. I, I've been doing something in broadcasting or writing for at least a decade now and somehow got stringed together uh, calling minor league soccer games, knowing nothing oh, wow. about soccer. And yeah, that was intense. Uh, and my co-host who's usually on the show, Chris Robb Jr. has played in the, uh, he's a football player, played college football and then played pro football for uh, indoor football league, the fan controlled football league. He tried out with the XFL so uh, I definitely have a uh, respect for uh, people trying, uh, athletes trying to, to make their career because it's, it's a mix. You have young guys like you trying to make it. You have older guys trying to hang on to their career. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of your teammates, Delano DeShields Jr., from the Texas Rangers, or former Texas yeah. Ranger. Um, and, and you see every day, if you follow the railroaders on social media or even the American association that players are getting picked up by major league organizations all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of very competitive baseball. Yeah. Um, and I think besides the baseball, there's a lot of adversity off the field, whether it's living situation, family, yeah. uh, travel. Um, and uh, probably the biggest factor is, especially for guys who haven't, you know, got that signing bonus or whatever is money. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, there's a lot of things that people don't see off the field that, you know, if a guy goes over for four, you know, you can give him all the crap you want, but um, you know, that's probably not the, the worst part of his day. That's probably the best part of his day. He's on the field. Um, he still has to, you know, go eat the spread after the game and go back to his host family and FaceTime his, family that lives a thousand miles away or, or yeah. whatever. It's, it's a lot of adversity and I give a lot of credit to these guys. And, you know, I, I probably don't show it enough, but all, every single guy that I've met and played with in there have all my respect and you know, most of them have my number. So, you know, most reach out whenever they need anything. Um, but yeah, like it's a lot of adversity. And like you said, give credit where it's due to those guys. Yeah, it's it's difficult because minor league baseball games, <clears throat> when you go to it as a fan, is set up like this family friendly environment. There are games going on, all kinds of fun fun stuff, uh, and you forget that the players, yeah, the, the players on the field are having the time of their lives. They're playing professional baseball, but it's their lives right now. Mm -hmm. Now, now you're you're blessed enough, or you already have a job, uh, you right? Know, still continuing your baseball career uh, as a coach but not a lot of players this is everything for them this is they're trying to make it to the next level and and a lot of people forget about that you know when you're talking about somebody goes over for four uh they have to keep going and in baseball yeah. you're probably playing the next day so you have to get over it really quick absolutely that's that's just part of it and uh you know i like it's a it's a weird split between like their mindset and mine mindset. I would love to see uh, a championship in Cleveland, um, you know, hang that banner or whatever. But I would I would love to see more 
of one of my closer friends on the team get picked up and chase his dreams. Yeah. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a split, you know, it's like, you know, the community wants a championship, but everyone in house wants to see these guys succeed and get out. So, you know, while, while winning is definitely part of Logan's plan and, you know, he, I think he's built a great team the past two and a half years. Um, you know, same thing with him. He, he loves winning and he, he'll let us know when we need to start picking it up. But, you know, his, his mindset too is building connections and getting guys out of there. Yeah. I remember, and we'll talk about this here in a second. Um, but you were talking about that. This is your major league baseball. This is it. This is what you want to do. You're having a blast. And, um, yeah, that kind of coincides with everything where, um, in, you know, major league baseball in the show, people are having careers and from the outside looking in, it's like, yeah, they're, they're professional baseball players, you know, they have it made. Uh, but, and, and some of them, you know, do not that they don't work their asses off to get to that level, you know, Aaron judges, Mike Trout's players like that who are making millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but most players aren't making that <laughs> well, especially in minor leagues. And, uh, they're going out there and, uh, putting their body through a lot of stuff that, and as a catcher, you know that, I mean, you're a young guy, but you know that being a catcher, if you watch any, uh, any baseball movie about catchers that you're going to have bad knees, you're going to have this. And, you know, um, you, you put your body through that. Um, yeah. And, and I think that fans of baseball, fans of minor league baseball, fans of the Cleveland Railroaders should just appreciate that while they can. Yeah. For sure. Um, like I said, the community, we've got a, we've got a great fan base, but you know, I think when times get tough, the, the, the crowd definitely, definitely shows that. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think it's just the fact that people need to, people need to realize why, why those guys are there. And, you know, while, while we do want to bring a championship to Cleburne and it's very possible and it's been possible the past three years, um, or the time I've been there, um, you know, the end goal for these guys is to, you know, not, not live in the Liberty Hotel in, in Cleburne. You know, they, they want to go to Arizona and make a spring training. So, yeah, definitely good, great points on your, on your part. We talked about um, you being a teacher, high school baseball coach, professional baseball player. Let's talk about a different possible career path for you, um, a broadcasting <laughs> career. Because the other night on the Railroaders broadcast, because you were a bullpen catcher, the first two innings, you jumped up there with Brad. And uh, I guess you were the color commentator there uh, for the first couple of innings. How was that? That was, like I, I mentioned this on Twitter, top five baseball experience in my life. Um, I've done a lot of cool things. I met a lot of cool people. Um, this ranks up there with me meeting Pudge Rodriguez for sure and making my major league debut or major league debut, professional debut. Uh, major you know, league these... debut yet so far. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, those three things right there, along with color card color coordinating with Brad, I, I told him before, you know, right when the anthem started, right when the anthem ended, I was like, Brad, like, you know, I was, I had a great time in Winnipeg when I played. And I was nervous, but I haven't been this nervous for an anthem in a while. And that's usually when my when my jitters come in is you know the anthem just because yeah it, the 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 place is silent and all you hear is your national anthem and you know your eyes are closed and you're just swimming in your head. And that's exactly what I was doing during uh, a pregame broadcast uh, national anthem. I was just you know don't stutter, don't do this, don't do this. You know make yeah. sure you're not saying the same word over and over again. And I ended up doing that. I listened back to it and I said, absolutely maybe eight times in two innings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a great experience and, you know, shout out to Brad for letting me do that. And uh, he said, I'm welcome back anytime. So hopefully I did a good job. Yeah. And maybe after your playing career is over, maybe, you you can still do that and teach and coach all at the same time. Yeah, uh, it'd be pretty cool. And, you know, I, that was my first time in the booth. And 
Dude, this this man Brad has I mean, his desk looks like he's been working 90 hours a week. I mean, yeah. it's like there's papers on the windows, there's papers on his desk. He's got his phone set up, he's got his laptop pulled up, he's got his pin out charting the game and circling things and having all these stats. It's like another behind the scenes thing that you don't see and he's putting in the work and he does a great job and you know, me and him have talked too, like you know, getting the opportunity to see these guys and, you know, win and be around these guys so much. It's, it's very humbling for both of us. No, I thought you did a great job. I didn't notice if you were saying absolutely a lot of times yeah. I've noticed, <laughs> I've noticed uh, that growing in my career doing podcasts and radio shows and everything that it's all in your head. Uh, the more you think about it, yeah, you're going to stutter more. You're going to do this and that. I I did Toastmasters for a little while, and I noticed, man, I say um and ah a lot. <laughs> uh, but most of the time, nobody really even notices it that much as long as you just keep going and, and, and do your best. And baseball is a really, really difficult sport to be a commentator for. Um, yeah. I know I have experience doing high school football commentating, and I mentioned the minor league soccer. I could imagine baseball. You you have to do that much work because obviously there are games every day. There's stats, the ridiculous amount of stats that you keep up with, and then the, obviously the knowledge of baseball. Uh, you did great. You have a great knowledge of baseball. It seems like, um, and obviously you, you have the you have the knowledge of the team as well. You were able to uh, to fit in there, but uh, I thought you did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, and one thing that kind of threw me off that I didn't really taken into consideration along with my, you know, start in Canada was the pitch clock. And yeah. so you're trying to, you're trying to spit off all these words and, you know, and it's foul ball after foul ball, ground out, one out, next guy up within 15 seconds. And you're trying to get out all these points. And yeah, like, like I said, it was a, it was something I didn't really think about in Canada too much when I played. And I remember walking back, I, I ran a guy down uh, to first base and I was walking back to home plate and Austin Fairchild, you know, yelled at me. He's like, Nick, there's a pitch clock now. So I, like, jogged back halfway back from first base and got the pitch off within five seconds. So, yeah. But, yeah, pitch clock is is definitely changing broadcasting and baseball at the same time. Yeah, I, I noticed, uh, again, going to the difficulty of being a play-by-play commentary in baseball, uh, especially if, if it's on, you know, whatever technical term you want to say, radio, if it's audio only. Um, you're having to paint a picture for uh, for the listeners, and and Brad does a great job of that. And, and a lot of professional uh, sports broadcasters have done a good job where they can they'll be telling a story, stop, not even miss a beat, you know, foul mm-hmm. ball, like yeah. you said, foul ball, whatever, O two count. You don't you call. I'm I'm not a, obviously not a baseball commentator, but say whatever, call the play, go right back. Yeah. To telling the story and keep going in and out because that's that's what I enjoy, you know, listening to the Texas Rangers broadcast with Eric Nadell. Yes. Um, obviously this year hasn't been doing it, but he he does a really good job of that. And you want to hear those stories. You want to hear I mean, lots of times, uh especially during blowouts and slow times of the game, it, it can get boring for some people and it's it's good to hear a lot of those stories and a lot of the behind the scenes type of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, before we leave, I want to ask you this question. I, I used to cover the Fort Worth Railroaders back in the, uh, or the Fort, Worth, the Fort Worth Cats back in the day, um, when they were a minor league team. Uh, yes. Get me, get me on this topic. If we're going, if we're going to Fort Worth Cats, get me on this topic. Let's see. Let's hear it. Uh, yeah, let's, let, let's bring the cats back. I mean, it, it's a shame what they let happen to LeGray Field right now. Um, but no, we're not, I can bring you on another podcast and talk about that. That'd be <laughs> I, I was all into the Fort Worth Cats back in the day. I had an online radio, a sports radio show. Um, and I got to interview a lot of the players back in 2007, 2008, around when they had won a championship or two. Yeah. Um, and this this question stuck every time. It always, always had a good answer. So I'll ask you whether professional, high school, even little league, whatever level, What's the best piece of advice a coach has ever given you? Oh, wow. Best piece of advice. Whether it has to do with baseball, whether it's funny, serious, whether it's about life. Um, I, I don't, I can't put a, a coach on it. 
on who told me this. It might have been 12U coach Frank Quintero, who I still keep in contact with, who is a great coach, a great person. Uh, control what you can control. And, you know, those those couple words, I, I at, there's at least four times a week where I either say it out loud as a joking thing where, you know, guys are talking about an umpire, you know, after the game. And I was just like, hey, control what you control, man. Like, it's part of it. And sometimes it gets chirped. Sometimes they stop talking about it. But in baseball, in life, like, there's a lot of times when I find myself just, like, wanting to start complaining or, you know, blame it on something else, blame it on another factor. And then, you know, when it comes down to it, it's just control what you can control. Um, you know, Unfortunately for me, the past, you know, from fall of 22 to last month, I've had two people pass away in my family. And, uh, you know, they were they were lights for me in my life and huge supporters. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a thing where I had to realize it is part of their journey. I, I have to control what I can control and keep moving forward and you know, everything I do now is in their name and in the Lord's name. But, um, but yeah, it was just every, every aspect you can put control, you control, you know, whether work setting, life, family. Um, yeah, it's something that I live by. And that, that kind of goes with to my other, my other thing is to each their own, you know, kind of let people do their own thing. If they're not bothering you, just kind of stay on your path and don't steer control what you can control it's a great piece of advice and uh, obviously i don't want to keep you too long y'all do have a game tonight no you're um, good man uh, make sure to stay on don't get off the video chat when we end the show but um guys thanks for tuning in this episode of the sports page is there anywhere we can follow you social media you want everyone to follow you yeah sure i'm on uh i'm on twitter uh, my first and last name, Nick Sanchez. Um, Instagram too, Nick Sanchez, N-I-K Sanchez. And yeah, those are, and then I'm on Facebook too. Uh, Facebook is more, more family-ish, but yeah. Twitter and Twitter and Instagram, we're going to find some like more baseball and coaching content for sure. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, everybody, make sure to subscribe, follow us. And until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you so much.